Well, good morning, church. Good day in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Today we will be we will be continuing our series in origins. <clears throat> Pardon me. Man, this has been an amazing series where we have gone through all of the different stories in Genesis. Genesis being the origins, right, of, of Scripture. That's, that's where it all originates from. Not only is where it starts uh, in the Bible, but it is where history, biblical history, originates from. And it's important for us to understand this biblical history uh, to know what it is that God's saying today when we look at his mighty, mighty word. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a new story. We've talked about Abraham, and we began to talk about Isaac. And today we're going to be talking about Esau and Jacob. The story of Esau and Jacob is an interesting one. It, uh, it, it leads up in Genesis to this, this spot. Uh, oh, I left my Bible over here. Let me grab that. It leads up in Scripture to this spot that... Abraham is at the end of his life. He's getting ready to pass on his mantle uh, and, and pass it on to Isaac, right? And that, that is going to be picked up by Isaac, but we're picking up the story where Isaac has young children. Because if you know in Scripture, whenever God is referenced as the God of old or the God of the Old Testament or the God of our ancestors, he's referenced as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's where the covenant with God started with his people, was first with Abraham, then with Isaac, then with Jacob. Here's the interesting thing, though, with the two kids. The patriarch would pass the mantle of blessing, the mantle of their life, of their family name, of who they were and what they were supposed to do, to the eldest son. The firstborn son was the one who carried it. Interesting, though, that Jacob is the patriarch that's mentioned, the God of Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, because Jacob was the second born. Esau was the first born. The mantle should have been passed to him. And I need you to understand before we get any further into this here in a moment in Genesis, uh, the importance of this mantle I'm talking about, right? So culturally understanding that the people of God were in a patriarch society where the firstborn son carried on the legacy, like I said, the name, the birthright, right? The firstborn would get a double portion of the inheritance. So whatever inheritance was going to get passed to the kids, that firstborn got the double portion of that. It was a big spot to be. So we're going to read the story of, of what happens here. And as we do, uh, I, I want to, before we get there, I want to have the context of scripture to remember where we're at in the story because to understand the arc this narrative of the bible we have to understand where we're at in the story so god creates adam and eve they're in the garden they sin they fall god was with them in the garden face to face immediate one-on-one -on -one relationship with them they just walked in the cool of the day sin came in god departed not because he wanted to, wanted to but because he had to because their unholiness could not coincide with his holiness so they separated. And there's this time where you have to understand in biblical history that the way that we understand religion and walking with God, that was not understood at that time. They were just doing life. And most of them were not serving God faithfully because he was removed by their own actions, right? So then we get to Abraham, and what happens with Abraham is God presents himself to Abraham and makes a covenant with him. He's the first one that God makes a covenant with in this way. And he says to him a number of incredible things. And I want to call that out, what he says. He, he gives him a bunch of promises. He says, if you serve me, I will do these things. That's really the agreement. The covenant is, you serve me, I will fulfill my end of the bargain of doing these things. Here's what he says to Abraham. He says, I will make, in Genesis 12, he says, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who dishonor you. All families of the earth shall be blessed through you. And then later in chapter 15, he continues his agreement, his covenant, and what he says is your offspring shall be countless like the stars. 
right? This is the promise he gave to Abraham. And then the last thing is he says, you will possess this land that you are living in. All of this land will belong to you. What's interesting to note is at this time, there is no law. We remember back, right, to Old Testament scripture and think, oh, that's the law. At this point, there is no law. The law has not yet been given. It is quite some time later that God gives the law. So at this time with Abraham, all Abraham knows is I'm supposed to serve God, and if I serve God, here's what he's promising me. That's the blessing of Abraham and the promise to Abraham. Serve me, you'll get these things. Now Abraham has two children. He has Isaac and Ishmael, and Isaac is the one to carry the covenant. We've talked about him, so we're going to move past this, but we're going to get to the part of the story in Genesis chapter 25 where these two sons are born uh, that we're talking about today, Jacob and Esau. We're going to be in Genesis 25, starting in verse 19. I'm reading an ESV today. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah. And in verse 21 it says, And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. There's a pattern in these patriarchs where in a patriarch society where they're used to having tons and tons of children, suddenly the wives aren't able to have children of God's patriarchs that he's chosen, right? And so they have to rely on God for the promise to be fulfilled and not in their own strength. It's the first time you start to see this type of theme. And what it says in verse 22 is when she was pregnant, it says, the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? I want to I take a note of, of what, what's really being said here in the Hebrew. Um, when it says, if, this is, if they're struggling inside of me, the mother is, is she's, Rebecca is in pain from these children who are in her womb currently. And what it says is, if this is so, why is this happening to me? They're, they're together. Why is this happening? And the original text actually more accurately transcribes it as, why go on living? That's how great the pain was inside of her before the birth even happened, is these children were fighting each other. And here's what it says. It says in verse 23, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Remember what I said about the patriarch society and the firstborn. This was a bizarre thing to say. This was not normal. The older will serve the younger was very counter to the way that things were done in that time. Verse 24, And when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first baby came out all red, and his body was like a hairy cloak. He was just a hairy baby. And we go on to learn that he was a hairy, hairy man as well. The first came out red, his, hair, uh, his body like a hairy cloak, and they called his name Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out, his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, which meant heel grabber. It was very on the nose, heel grabber. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And when the boys grew up, Esau was a skilled hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Look at this. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. And Rebecca loved Jacob. Let's go back to that, to that last verse really quick. I want to take note of this before we move any further. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game in this translation, loved Esau. You know what that means? He was a good hunter and he had good food, so his dad loved him. And that is why he preferred him. There's nothing else to it. His dad liked him because he had good food. And I'm sure all the dads in the room are going, amen, if my kids cook me good food all the time, I'd love them too. But as we go about this story, I would like to make a stark warning, first and foremost, parents, do not show favoritism to your children. You're going to see in this story why. Because this was not written by Isaac. This was not written by this family. This was, was written by a writer at a later time. And the genealogy, the story of these parents and their kids, 
This was so widely known that the parents had favoritism for one or the other that it was written down in history. That's some strong public favoritism. And let me give you the warning now. What you're going to see in the story is consequence of the parents' actions in one regard, and that is my first warning of the day. Parents, don't show favoritism. That's just a free nugget of the day. That's not even the sermon. That has nothing to do with what I'm preaching about even. So we're going to go to the next part where we, we get to this interesting part of the story where um, the boys have grown up. A little bit of time has passed. And we're going to see what comes of these brothers who are at odds with one another, who are prophesied that the older will always serve the younger. And interestingly, in Hosea, uh, the prophet actually speaks of this and speaks of it in a way that because of Jacob's actions, even from the womb, it says that God had a problem with it. It does. The prophet clearly says that God had an indictment against him because of his actions and the more actions that are to follow. Follow along with me. We're almost there. So we're going to get to the part of the story where uh, in, this, in this next part in Genesis, we see that Esau, um, Esau does something interesting starting in verse 29. So let's go to verse 29. Once, Jacob was cooking some stew. This is some time later. Uh, we don't know how long precisely, but this is some quite a few number of years later. Once Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. Remember, he's a hunter, so he's out in the land hunting. And he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of this red stew. I'm famished. Go to the next one. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. His brother comes in from the field famished and hungry, and his reply to him is, oh, you're hungry? Great, sell me your birthright. I imagine Jacob was almost kidding a little bit, right? You look at it, and you think that he's like, yeah, I'm cooking some food. I've got this pot of stew. My brother comes along, and he says, sure, you want some? Give me your birthright. And look at what Esau says next. In the next verse, it says, look, I'm about to die. What good is the birthright to me? Next verse. But Jacob said, swear to me first, so he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. What is Esau's birthright? Birthright is different from blessing. Let's set a clear separation here that birthright and blessing in the scriptures were not the same thing. They were, they were very unique to one another. Birthright specifically is talking about what the father passed on to the son, the firstborn, when he died. Possessions, land, money, and then like I said, the family name. Those are the birthright. These are not the same as blessing. But what it says is he despised his birthright. These were the things that were given to him by default. These are the things that belong to him. He just hadn't yet received them. So we're going to go for a moment, and we're going to read Hebrews chapter 12, because there's a parallel in Hebrews chapter 12 that compares what Esau did to something else in a New Testament context, right? But what we need to understand is that that word despised. It means that Esau never had regard from it, even from the beginning. The birthright comes with a greater calling, and he despised it. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to have to live this way. He didn't even care about these things. He didn't care about what was to come. He cared about himself. He cared about what he needed. And in a moment of instant gratification, he traded his birthright for some stew because that's how little he cared about it. There's a debate between a lot of theologians whether or not he was actually dying of starvation or not. I like to look at it and think that he wasn't. Based on the text and what I've studied, I don't think he was. I don't think he was actually starving like to death. He says, what good is it to me? I think he's being sarcastic. The original text reads to me like he had so little regard for what he already held that he just said, I'm about to die, I don't even care. It's like when you haven't eaten in one day it may feel painful. You know you're not about to die. The man went out hunting, didn't catch any game, didn't have any food, came back, was hungry, and traded it. That's how little regard. I'm emphasizing this because of how important that is to understand he never held it in high regard from the first place. So now let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. 
Hebrews chapter 12 has an interesting parallel to this. And we're going to read through a chunk of Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to break it down. And we're going to get to the end of Hebrews chapter 12, and it's going to immediately pull together. We're starting in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, the therefore is that the writer of Hebrews was just prior talking about all these great people of faith in Scripture, all these men who went before who held the highest strength of faith. So he gets to the end of this long list of faith, and then he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Pause. We're going to look at just this. The race. We need to understand the context of what he's talking about. In that culture and in that time, foot races became a very popular sport. And the interesting thing in that time is that foot races, people would amass to come watch a bunch of men run and chase and, and try to run the fastest, right? Just like we do with the Olympics or with sports today. But at that time, it was the sport. It was a big deal. And here's what's important to note culturally. In those foot races, the men ran practically naked. And the reason was that they very much believed that any amount of weight on them of clothes at all would slow them down the fraction of the second they needed to beat their opponents. And it was culturally acceptable, so they would all get there in their beautiful robes before they started, and they'd strip down, and they'd go start the race. They'd get on the starting line. So in that context, let's read this again in Hebrews, because it's important that if we're looking at it through that, through that frame, this changes all of a sudden. Since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, all of the people who went before us who had great faith, they're there. Let's look to that and remember, oh, remember who had that faith? Let us lay aside every weight. The clothes. He's comparing it to sports. Let us lay aside every weight, and he compares that weight to sin. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What he's saying about the sin is that that sin is ever-present. As believers, sin is always around us. Whether or not we agree and partake is the next step of that. But it is always there. And what he's saying is all that great cloud of witnesses, all the witnesses of the people in the audience, they see us. They know that we're believers. All of the great men of God who came before us, for that purpose, there is so much great work to be done still, we need to set aside every ounce of weight that prevents us from running as quickly and as powerfully as we can towards the cross and to bring in kingdom of God to earth today. That's the importance of this verse. That's verse 1. Lord, I'm not even preaching out of Hebrews. Verse 2, come on. <laughs> Here's what we do now. We set it aside, and then it says, looking to Jesus instead of having these things weighing us down, cast them off, look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Not only is our faith based on Jesus, Jesus is the one who perfects our faith over time. Hang on to that word perfect. We're going to come back to it. The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand at the throne of God. Jesus endured the cross for what? The joy set before him. He was full of shame. He felt shame. He was man. He was full of grief. It says that he went off to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying before the crucifixion, and most scholars believe that it says that he was, he was bleeding. His sweat, there is a condition that the amount of strain that he was, he was experiencing caused him to sweat his own blood. That is the level of strain that he had. However, the joy that was set before him is what led him to endure that moment, led him to endure the cross. What was the joy? <laughs> a new heaven and a new earth. Every single person who puts their faith in him being saved. Knowing that all the saints of old were being swooped up into the heavens, that all the sleeping were being awoken, there is so much joy in the cross. But for him, there was so much sorrow. 
So he set aside the sorrow and focused on the joy set before him to endure the momentary pain. Let's keep going. Verse 3, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you might not grow weary or faint-hearted. What he's saying is when you grow weary of doing good, you're like, this Christian thing is hard. Living for God, serving God is hard. Remember him who endured the insults, who endured the stoning, who endured the flogging, who endured the cross itself. That's what we remember, and that's where our endurance lies, is remembering him. Consider him who endured the sinner's such hostility against him so that you might not grow weary and faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He makes it clear what he's talking about. He's not talking about the insults of other people against us being a believer. No, no, no. He's talking about and comparing Jesus' endurance of the cross as our endurance against sin. I think this gets lost out of context sometimes, and it's looked at and gone, well, I can be a Christian. I know the the world's going to hate me, but I can endure. Look at what Jesus did. Okay, yeah, that is true. That's biblically accurate. That's not what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's saying when you're struggling against sin, remember Jesus. You haven't shed your blood in your fight against sin yet, and even if you have, you have not died, so you you have not yet gone to the point of Jesus. Because Jesus didn't just endure the pain on the cross. He endured the sins of the world being cast upon him all at one time. If we have not yet done that, he's saying, you haven't gone as far as him. It's a hard verse, isn't it? Let's keep going. Verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? This is talking about... uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11 is what he's quoting here. And what he says is, My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. When you have a beautiful, beautiful rose bush and it begins to bud and flowers emerge, how do you reward that rose bush? You prune it. So when we're growing in the Lord and we start wondering, why do I feel like I'm being pruned? God, why am I being disciplined? God, why am I enduring sin? He is saying, the author of this book is saying, we endure sin in a way that is likened to the disciplining of a father disciplining his son. We're going to go on in the chapter to see a point where it says, couldn't God just take away the sin? Altogether. Is, it so, is God's arm so short that he couldn't say, oh, you're a believer now? Temptation be gone. <laughs> and it never comes again. Wouldn't that be amazing? Oh, I wouldn't have to worry about wanting to gossip anymore. I wouldn't have to worry about wanting to cheat anymore. I wouldn't have to worry about wanting to embezzle just that little bit of money from my job anymore. I wouldn't want to have to, right? I wouldn't have to worry about any of that because I wouldn't even want it and it wouldn't even be a thought in my mind. What he says, though, is... He's likening, the author, when I say he, he's likening that struggle with sin to the chastisement of a child. Well, isn't that strange? But as parents, why do you discipline your children? You want them to grow up to be amazing men and women who are good parts of society, who pull their weight, who are respectful to authority who know how to have a good work ethic and drive, right? That's what we do. And if we didn't discipline them, aren't we regarded as bad parents when we do that? (laughs) Even more so, God with us. Let's keep going. Verse 7. For it is discipline that you have to endure. There it is, blatantly. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you like children. For what good father doesn't discipline his children? Wow. That is a new way to look at it. And let's be clear for a second. Um, God's not giving you temptation to sin. 
We can look at the story of Jesus in the wilderness as testament to this. The Holy Spirit wasn't the one tempting Jesus in the wilderness, was he? No, the enemy was, remember? Stories that Jesus goes into the wilderness 40 days, 40 nights, and he's fasting in the desert, and he's tempted over and over and over again. Who tempts him? The deceiver, very clearly. Who led him to the wilderness? I heard it murmured. Say it louder. Who led him to the Holy... Who led him in? I almost said it. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. The scripture says clearly that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Hang on a second. That seems a little backward. Why did the Holy Spirit lead Jesus to a place that the Holy Spirit knew he would be tempted? For it is discipline that you have to endure. What do we endure? You are enduring against sin. Hmm. Interesting. Let's keep going. If you are left without discipline, verse 8, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. God help me if I am not disciplined. Because what does that mean? I'm an illegitimate child. That's a hard word. Man, this whole chapter. I'm kind of done with chapter 12 already, but we're going to keep going anyway. Verse 9, besides this, we have had earthly father who disciplined us, and we respected them. Every person in the room, regardless of whether or not your father was a good father or bad father on earth, that's not, that's not it. We can all agree, though, that if we look back, everybody in the room, to our fathers, or we look upon a father figure in our life, or we look upon anybody else who has a father that we know, when we are grown adults, we look back on those disciplines and go, thank God. How many times have you been walking out in the store? I, I'm going to say this as a young millennial where the, the worldview of how to parent has changed. But I can't tell you how many times I've walked out as a parent, seen someone else's kids acting out, and I think, man, I'm so sorry for that parent. And there's another parent who looks and goes, man, that kid needs a spanking. And then you have the ones who you see kids growing up and you go, man, that kid was never spanked as a kid. You can tell right now. Because as an adult, you can tell. The example not being about the actual act, hear me very clearly. The example that I share that for is to bring it back to this, that we say, we look at our earthly fathers and we go, discipline? Good. We want to be disciplined. We need to be. Maybe when we're in the moment, nobody wants it. I've never met anybody who says, yes, please, I want discipline. I want to have to endure a horrible thing. I want to be told that I'm wrong. I want somebody, please, somebody come along and just chastise me for what I've done. No, nobody wants that. But in retrospect, everybody does, right? Because we know that it brings us to a place of what? Maturity, right? We have to have discipline in order to have maturity. Verse 10, for they disciplined us for a short time, earthly fathers, as it seemed best to them. But the disciplines for us, for our good, that we may share his holiness. Share in his holiness. Before I go any further, we're going to talk about holiness for a second and what that means. And I'm going to make a strong, impactful, deep cutting call on our church. Before I do, there is a holiness that is reserved for God that only God has. This word, though, is translated as one of two things. Holiness and sanctification. In order that we may share in his holiness. I'm going to hit you something that's really tough. Christ, when he was crucified, gave us the ability to be holy. Period. And I'm going to prove it here in a second. Let's keep reading. For they verse 10, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all dis discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later 
It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It leads us into a place where we can act in a way that actually brings peace to our lives. Verse 12, Therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight, straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. What he's saying is he's likening the, the people of God to the body again. He's using that same example. And what he's trying to say is that when someone is not walking in righteousness, they don't need to be pulled out of joint, removed from the body. No, 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 we need to bring them up into that holiness, is what he's saying here. So strengthen your weak knees, make straight your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of pay, place, but it would be healed. He's saying a place of sin can be healed. That's what he's saying here. Verse 14, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, we have all been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. We have been sanctified through Jesus Christ's suffering. Hebrews 10.14 says, for by a single offering, he has perfected those for all time who have been sanctified. Sanctified. Holiness. We as a people are not sinners saved by grace. We were once sinners. We are now saints who were saved by grace. I need you to understand this, and I'm just going to say it blatantly. We are called the holiness. Holiness means blamelessness. Holiness means above reproach, without questionability. Holiness means perfect, without blemish, and without sin. Faith in Jesus Christ gives us the ability to be saved, but on earth we are called to holiness, which means casting aside every weight that is holding us back from following Jesus with everything we have. That means our call is to be holy. The statement, it's impossible for man to be holy, leads us to a place where we no longer even strive for that holiness. There is no striving in God for your salvation. It's a free gift. It is by grace we have been saved through our faith. Period. End of subject. New subject. You've now been saved. You must now be sanctified. That is not immediate overnight. That is a process that requires a constant washing of the word. And we are called to that place. Verse 15. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many defiled. Lord, a root of bitterness is something that is hard on the church. He's referring to Deuteronomy 12. In Deuteronomy 12, there's a moment where God is talking to his people and he says, for they have begun to go and serve pagan gods. In them is a root of bitterness. We do have pagan gods that we could serve. You could convert to Buddhism or Hinduism, right? There are options. Those are pagan gods. I would venture as far to say that in our culture, our gods look a little different. The god of idolatry of self the God of self-image, the God of money. Those things that have root in us cause a bitterness in us that what it said is it spreads in such a way that no believer and no amount of doctrine is exempt from the potential infection of that bitterness. It's a call to uproot the bitter root. This is not a bitter root that can also still, you know, grow a healthy plant. You know, some roots can be bitter while the rest of the plant is healthy. No, 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 no. It's not saying that good fruit is possible. The bitter root in the original language is indicating a root so rotten that all of its fruit comes out the same way. What he's saying is that we are called to uproot that bitterness because the bitterness that is in us spreads amongst the church to other believers. We have a call upon ourselves to uproot that bitterness. Here we go. This is the tie-in now to Genesis 25. You ready? All of this to be said, talking about sin. 
Verse 16. Do all of this that no one would be sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. And what you learn afterwards, verse 17, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected and found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Hear me carefully of what this is saying. In the story of Esau, going back now to Genesis 25, Esau sold his birthright, not his blessing. Esau, in New Testament terms, he didn't sell his salvation. He had no regard for his sanctification. The birthright for him was what belonged to him. What we see is what belonged to him is all the things that were promised to Abraham, which includes Jesus Christ being his descendant. The salvation of the world was his birthright. There was such a heavy weight on who he was, and it belonged to him. And he gave it away for a bowl of soup. I'll ask you today. God's charged us with the Great Commission. Go to many nations. Go to all nations. Speak the word of God. Do you despise your birthright? Do you have so little regard for your birthright that you would trade it away in a moment? That you would trade you you have the opportunity to gossip and you pick it up. Your birthright is to speak life, but you would rather pick that up and gossip for a momentary satisfaction of saying, at least the spotlight's not on me for a moment. Would you pick up? stinginess with your finances and what you have and your resources and your skills and your time because your birthright is to be cheerful givers. But instead, would you choose in a moment of instant gratification to hold on to those things that, quote, belong to you? You can see how I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about something completely different. Your salvation is secured through faith in Jesus Christ. Hear me very clearly. My first point for today and the other three that come immediately follow. The first point is don't sell your birthright. Don't sell your birthright for something that seems good. Esau forfeited his blessing. He did not forfeit his sonship, though. Because we continue in the story and he is still Isaac's son. Don't allow things to master you in such a way that you still submit to the yoke of slavery because we are called through our birthright to freedom. So the things that master you, I have to have that drink. I gotta go smoke that cigarette. I gotta go gamble this money. I gotta gossip. I gotta eat this food. I gotta eat that. Oh, I have to have that dessert. We should be mastered by nothing but in everything have bondage to nothing and be free from everything. That's our birthright. So later we see in Genesis 27, verse 1 through 4, going back to Genesis, the next part of the story and what Jacob does. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so he couldn't see, he called Esau, his brother, or his son, and came uh, to come to him, and he said, my son, and he said, here I am, and he said, I'm old, I don't know the day of my death, and what he does is he says, go out, hunt me some game, bring it back to me, I'm going to eat of it, and then I'm going to give you the fatherly blessing, because I'm about to die, that was the next blessing that he was set to receive, Esau, firstborn, received that blessing, Isaac probably had no idea that he already sold his birthright, there's nothing in scripture to indicate that he did, so he goes off and he starts hunting and Rebecca overhears this and he grabs Jacob and he pulls, she pulls Jacob aside and says, we're going to trick your father. You're going to get that blessing. So they put a hairy coat on him so he feels, because remember he was a hairy man, he saw, put a hairy coat on him and they cook up some food and he goes in and he says, here I am, father, I brought you food. And he says, you sound like Jacob. Come here and let me feel you so I know that you're my son because he wanted to feel the hair. And he feels him and feels the hair and goes, oh, truly you are my son. He ate the food, he enjoyed the food, and he gives him the blessing. And then we see right afterwards that Esau comes back 
And he says, here I am, Father, I've brought you the food. And the father says, I already ate. What are you talking about? Who did I give the blessing to? And Esau immediately realizes what just happened. And he says, oh God, please no, Father, give me a blessing too. And Isaac says, I have nothing left to give you. I've already given it to your brother. And so Esau cries out and he says, Jacob truly is his name. Heel grabber. Because not only did he steal my birthright, he has now stolen my blessing. Jacob, interestingly though, is depicted as the villain in the story, isn't he? Steal, steal, lie, deceit. And guess what? God still chose him. Can I prove it to you? Jacob didn't stumble into being the patriarch by chance. God chose him. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 10. This is another callback to the same story now in the book of Romans. It says, When Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or evil, neither of them had had a chance to prove themselves as good or evil, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told that the older would serve the younger. As it is written... Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. That's in Malachi chapter 1 that it says that. Point number two. God qualifies us, not our actions. Jacob was deceitful. He lied. He cheated. But he was chosen. Then we see that Jacob goes and he runs away because Esau wants to kill him. And he goes and he's traveling and he hides away. And when he's hiding away and he's sleeping, he has a dream. And God speaks to him and gives him a promise and says, you're going to carry many nations. He gives him the promise again. And Jacob says, then if that's the case, I will serve you, God. So he goes off and he gets married and he has kids. And then he calls out for Esau many, many, many years later. This is the end of the story. And he says, I've done all these things my whole life. Hopefully my brother doesn't want to kill me anymore because Esau wanted to kill him so bad. So he runs away, right? Years, decades later. I hope he doesn't want to kill me. He writes to him. He's in a nearby land, so he writes to him. Sends a servant and says, Esau, I've gotten many things. I'd love to share this blessing with you. Please don't hate me anymore. And he gets word back, and all he hears back from the servant, he says, hey, we talked to Esau. He's coming to meet you with 400 men. And Jacob panics. Absolutely panics. All the deceit is gone. There's no more lying. There's no more cheating. There's nothing else he can do to get out of it. There is nothing left at all in his own power. <laughs> he devises a plot anyway, and he gets his servants to get all of this blessing, this, this food and this livestock and servants, and he sends it, and he goes, hopefully Esau will get this on his way to me, and he'll, he'll be appeased, right? And then he sends his, his wife and his kids on, and he's alone. And we see a very interesting story. This is the end, in closing. Genesis 32, verses 9 through 12. In verse 9, excuse me, that's the wrong part. It's in verse 22. The same night he arose and took his two wives and he sent them off. And he took everything and sent them on. And verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he didn't prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled him. And then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he said to him, what's your name? And Jacob said, Jacob. And then he said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, it will be Israel, for you have striven with God and with man, and you have prevailed. This is the start of the nation of Israel. The 12 children that Jacob will have, whose name is now Israel, will lead the tribes. The 12 tribes of Israel. And what's really interesting at this point is that Jacob has come to the end of himself, and it's this strange story that's depicted as an angel coming down that represents God himself 
and physically wrestles with Jacob his whole life. All he's done is say, in my own power, I'm going to cheat. In my own power, I'm going to deceive. He's wrestling. In my own power, I'm going to do this. He already has the birth right now. He took it. No matter how he took it, it's his. He has the blessing. I know what's coming. It's mine, though. I'm going to do it my way. And he comes to the end of himself. And instead of doing anything else in his own power, he has to do it in God's. And he wrestles with God. Point number three, my final point is this. The things of this world will never satisfy us. Only God will. He tried to be satisfied by everything else and never was. Until he came to God. And then he received that blessing and he stopped looking. He didn't need anything else other than God. There's a quote from Tim Keller that I want to read in closing. And he said this. He said, Just like the Israelites were brought out of captivity and bondage, led into the promised land, and then given the law, so God rescues us first before he tries to reform us. We are called to be reformed. We are called to be made new. And we are called to look like God. We are called to holiness. Will you sell your birthright? Or will you turn to God and say, I know I need to change my ways to look more like you and hang on to that birthright and know I'm probably not even that hungry 